Welcome to the Cast Blast Grill Chill Podcast with Jeremy and Trevor, the podcast that's all about hunting, fishing, grilling, and chilling out and having a good time in the outdoors. Hey guys, a quick intro before we start the podcast. Can you guys go please give us a like on all of our social media and make sure to subscribe and like the podcast and rate us five stars if you can. It'd really help us out. We're Cast Blast Grill Chill on all social media platforms. We'd really appreciate it. Thanks guys. Alrighty guys, welcome to Cast Blast Grill Chill. Uh, We're going to Call a little audible on this one. Texas Parks and Wildlife has been a little busy at the moment, and we're having a little uh, scheduling issue. So we're going to go ahead and push them off to the third episode, and we're going to go ahead and run our Onyx Maps episode. Which is a, a great a great preview for uh, for what's to come, man. Um, Onyx, great people. Uh, big shout out to those guys over there for, for coming on with us, and man, we had a great conversation and I, I think we want to, we want to kind of privy that conversation with some stuff that uh, we missed a little bit of and uh, a little catch up as well. Yeah. Um, I know a couple of the things that we were talking about right after the podcast, we kind of got sideways talking and, you know, we had Dylan from on X on and he's the, uh, oh, he's going to kill me. I can't remember his, his title it's community community coordinator that's what it is uh but but yeah uh but there was a couple things that you'd wanted to mention that um uh, we just kind of got sideways chasing squirrels um when he brought up bear hunting and getting to go on the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation hunt uh that we kind of forgot to bring up there at the end but uh yeah one of the ones I know you that you were really interested in bringing up was the uh, Boone and Crockett layers. And that's one of the premium layers on the map. Yeah. So that's uh, all these premium layers are a little extra charge, but man, that's something that I'm definitely looking at, at signing up for and just go ahead and pulling the trigger on. Cause uh, a lot of that is showing, showing you, uh, y- you know, in, in whatever area, if there's a registered, you know, Boone and Crockett. And I, I don't know all the details of it because I've never had the layer myself, but, just from the description that Onyx has, it it seems pretty cool, and they're pulling all that info, of course, straight from Bruin and Crockett, and they're working hand in hand with that company. Yeah, and the other layer they have is the uh, National Wild Turkey Federation layer, which also seems like another quality layer, you know, for anyone who likes chasing turkeys. Yeah, man. I mean, they're they're working hand in hand, like I said, with with all of these organizations and and all these groups to. Uh, to really offer some really cool stuff on their, some of their premium stuff. Uh, uh, a lot of them, I, I'm, I may like wait to purchase, uh, you know, until I'm going, let's say I'm gonna go Turkey scout. Then I may just go ahead and make that purchase right there. And not be able to see, you know, uh, when I, when I'm doing my online scouting, you know, what kind of, what kind of record Tom's been pulled out of this place, this place and this place, and just kind of daydream a little bit and give me an idea if, if there's a place around me that's producing better birds than, than some of the others. Yeah, definitely. And then there's also the, uh, and actually I, I just pulled up my app here. The, uh, national wild Turkey Federation, wild Turkey records actually isn't a premium layer. Um, it's the layer that's below it, which is the Easton's MRS layer, which is the premium. Okay. I'm not familiar with what the Easton's is. Uh, does it give a description there? I'm yeah. Sure the Eastman's, Magazine partnered to provide a map statistics throughout the western U.S. switch between deer, elk, and pronghorn. This special layer is available for nine ninety nine. Perfect, man. Yeah, some of those. I mean, I think I think most of the premium layers, if not all of them, are nine ninety nine. Yeah, uh, I, I believe I know for a fact the Boone and Crockett one's nine ninety nine. And let me check real quick here. Uh, yep, the Prairie Dog one is nine ninety nine too. But, uh, yeah, some of the stuff we've been up to in the meantime is, uh, I was down at the coast and, and, you know, since we recorded this podcast, uh, I was having a little, a little issue in the surf we we're, we we're down at the, the Gulf coast here in Texas. And I was having a little, little issue with the surf being too rough. And I had a low pressure system that was, that was in full swing and the fish just weren't having it, man. Nobody was catching anything. Um, so that next day I texted you and I was like, Hey man, looking for suggestions. I don't want to go back to where I was at last night. And so we just started sharing waypoints back and forth, just trying to figure out, 
oh, this looks good. This looks good. You know, with the wind doing this, maybe uh, maybe they'll be doing this. And so that waypoint share feature that's talked about in this episode is um, man, it's great. Um, we got to really test it out, and I'm, I mean, I don't even know how many we sent back and forth. It was a, at least ten. Yeah, definitely because I guess you finally. I sent you a couple waypoints before you went down. They were like, oh, hey, you can check out this spot and this spot and this spot when you told me you were going down there. And then you're like, nah, I'm just going to go fish off the pier. And you said you were going to fish all night and then try the, try the surf in the morning. I was like, well, you know, that's a good plan. And then I guess you called me about 10.30 or 11 was like, hey, with a falling barometer and a strong outgoing tide, you know, where should I be? with these conditions. And I was just like, I was like, I got a couple spots. Let me send you some waypoints. And I started shooting you waypoints. And then you started shooting me some back. Well, I've tried here in the past and here in the past. I'm like, that could work. You may want to wait till low tide for this spot or, you know, wait till the tide switches and starts coming in to go fish this other spot. Um, but, uh, I know I saw on your Facebook page that Danielle managed to catch a stingray. Um, did you manage to catch any other fish while you were down there? Yeah, man, you know, that, that second night we ended up switching from the surf and going to the bay. We were still on that falling tide, but uh, we went to a spot that it, it was kind of on the back of a neighborhood that, you know, is uh, is right there on the bay and all the channels and stuff. But uh, a spot that I have fished before, but in a different section, the the section that I, I previously had fished, there was a bunch of people already there. And so we went down to this this other section and uh i was able actually able to get on on x because it looked like there was a lot there but an undeveloped lot and it was actually it was like sod but it was not a, a house lot at all it was it was part of the bay system there part of like the marsh right there um and it was confusing because there was like no parking any time signs and stuff like that so that was cool i got to use that as well to make sure that if i just didn't break that no parking right here sign oh yeah i can walk right across this grass we set up two lawn chairs and uh threw the poles out man ended up uh we caught about 15 fish and maybe maybe three hours or so um got to watch the sunset danielle did a time lapse of the sunset that turned out really cool i'll post that up at some point and uh yeah uh stingray caught two black drum a couple of gaff top a couple of hardhead a couple of croaker uh, you know, at that point, after almost being skunked the night before, I think we caught two fish the night before. Uh, we were just happy to catch some, you know, and get that get that kind of skunk off and actually land some fish and just be able to have some fun with it. You know, we didn't go down there just to just to hang out. We did go down there primarily to fish. So, well, you're doing better than me. I haven't been able to wet a line here in a couple of weeks. It just seems like every time I have the opportunity, either I've got weather rolling in. Or I wind up having house chores to do. So at least you managed to get down there and go fishing. Yeah, well, hey, it was my birthday, so I uh, I put a uh, a cease and desist to the house chores, and we we hauled butt to the coast. Yeah, I'm gonna have to do the same for my birthday. I just haven't figured out what I want to go, where I want to go yet, because yeah. that'll be by the time my birthday rolls around on the 26th of July, we'll be uh, shoot right at a month out of hunting season. So. And I wish my birthday was in like November or something or October. And then that just gave me a, a, another good excuse to go on a extended hunting trip. Shoot. I don't need an excuse for those. I just need vacation time. No, oh, yeah, no, I'm just saying that's, that's even more of an excuse for me to go on a extended hunting vacation. You know, just give me a, any, any excuse I can get. It's a good excuse, but yeah, well, I mean, you know, we've got our, our Black Friday tradition of, you know, waking up super early to go kill ducks where most people are waking up super early to go stand in line for a deal on a big screen TV. Yeah, and the good thing about that is uh, a lot of the guys that are also duck hunting, a lot of times they get sucked in by a significant other or some kids or something to go Black Friday shop. Man, and you got to go get that Tickle Me Elmo. Yeah, yeah, Tickle Me Elmo is important, you know, top of the priority list uh, and while you're doing that, we're going to have the spot to ourselves. So that is probably out of any day that we go hunt that like should have a lot of people. I would have to say consistently that day has been either one of two ways, either Deadsville, nobody's there or everybody's there. 
Yeah, uh, the the other one for me that usually is super dead is Christmas morning. Well, yeah, that's totally understandable because most people are traveling. Yeah, or have kids and are waking up early to give their kids the presents. And yeah, I usually duck hunt till about 9, 10 a.m. Then I'll drive the 30, 40 minutes back to the house and go uh, go do Christmas with the family. So, Yeah, see, I'm getting up about the same time as you wrangling kids, putting them in the truck to usually drive to your mom's house or drive to our grandmother's house to go do family Christmas. And by the time you get there, I've already got a couple of ducks in the bag, hopefully. So. You, you typically do. You like to rub it in. Yeah, man. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to using Onyx for some waterfowl scouting uh in, in the future that's something that i have not really used water sorry on x for uh in the past uh was any waterfowl stuff um a lot of that i like to put my eyes on and uh i, I was using some other some other stuff for that uh so i'm excited to to see what what kind of the features look like around big bodies of water and some swampy stuff and uh i think it'll be interesting yeah, I definitely think I've been scouting a few duck spots with it, basically just to check to see if places that I knew to be public land were actually public land. And, you know, uh, I like the fact that their aerial photography is not the same as Google Maps on their hybrid layer. So you Absolutely. can go through there and, you know, get a more up-to-date picture of some of the some of the areas that I like to go hunt because with some of the floods we've had the past couple of years, a lot of the areas I like to hunt are all flooded out in the Google map view right now. So either I'm having to click back a couple of years in the timeline feature whenever I'm using the laptop, uh, but I can always just log into my Onyx and go look at, you know, the airplane pictures that they use for their hybrid mode. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's helped me out a few times. Uh, just like you said, because the most recent pictures on like Google maps and stuff, it's, it's flooded around here. Um, so that's uh that's definitely been super helpful um other than that i was just looking around my neighborhood here after uh we did this interview and came up across a piece of county land that is right next to the back property the undeveloped part of my neighborhood but how it's no other it has no access to it aside from the back of my neighborhood now I'm I'm in the the process of trying to figure out uh, who I need to talk to to ask for permission to hunt this land or find out exactly what it's used for. But Onyx did help me realize that this who owns the land, you know, that the county owns the land, and uh, at that point I'll be able to contact the right person at least. And uh, you know, from let's say Google Maps. Uh, you know, that looked like an extension of a private landowner's land, which I would have never known that the county had a locked up piece of land in the middle of all this private. So that's a that's a super cool thing that I found. And uh, not a lot of people know about it, I'm sure. So if I could get access on that, it's like a 20 minute walk from my house. That'd be a pretty sweet deal. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one other thing I'd like to talk to before we kick it on over to our interview with Dylan with Onyx Maps is uh, you called me today right as we were both leaving work and you kind of went down your gear list that you're getting ready for your mule deer hunt. Um, you told me that you got your Mystery Ranch pack coming and you got some other gear rolling in here in the next couple days. Um, I know that you've been using Onyx a little bit to go ahead and start scouting you some spots up there. How's that been going for you? Man, it's been going good. Uh, Onyx was actually actually used, and the Waypoint Share feature was actually used the first time um, our buddy Tobin with Top Pin Taxidermy, he, he actually uh, invited me on this trip and uh, said, hey, what do, you, what do you think about going up here? And he's like, I'll send you a Waypoint. You got, do you have Onyx? I was like, yeah. And so he sent me the Waypoint, and from there we kicked it off, and uh, and – you know, it's been that that trip has been 100% on X scouting uh, so far. So I know we're both trying to figure out times. I think he's got himself a, a time picked out where he's going to be able to run up there and uh, actually do some 
some boots on the ground scouting. Um, but you know, it's been going great. Yeah. I talked to you about my gear list earlier. I've been typing it up the past two mornings, just on, uh, on the way to work. I've been like voice texting it in my phone. So it's funny by the time I get to work, it's, it's telling me that I'm supposed to be bringing some weird word that I've never heard before. And so I'm having to go back and edit it all, but finally got it all up there and, uh, called you today, went over it. And we were just kind of talking about different water bladder options and, uh, some camp water stuff. And, um, got some binos in, got the mystery ranch pack on the way. Uh, just purchased the, uh, Alaska guide creations, bino harness. Um, some more gear purchase stuff coming, um, water sterilization stuff. Uh, I think uh, there's going to be a, a new tent purchase in the works. So a lot of new gear going into this one. Um, this time of year, I'm usually spending about $200 in decoys, but this year it's not going to happen. Uh, we were having a conversation about waiter purchases as well that I was kind of browsing around on that, but man, I got... I got bigger fish to fry this year. I got uh, some serious money going into this trip. So I'm sure it'll be a great trip no matter what the outcome. But um, Tobin and I are actually going to sit down and do a whole podcast on on the Hunt, Fish, Repeat podcast of uh, of what we're going to go through on this trip. And it'll kind of be a, a spread out series. So look forward to that if you're if you're into that podcast. Definitely. Well, shoot. I guess we'll go ahead and call it there. Um and we'll kick it on over to to Dylan's interview that he did with us and let him get into all the nitty gritty details. And, you know, I'm still waiting for my uh my my waypoint to bear camp. Me too, man. Uh he needs to send that over. Uh I think we're a little late to the game by this point, but uh hey, maybe we can make it up to Montana, at least get some bear meat off of him or something. Maybe. And I guess we're going to give away a one-year elite membership to the first person who tags Cast Blast Grill Chill in a post on either Facebook or Instagram. So Tag the, Onyx in that as well. Yeah, tag Cast Blast Grill Chill, Onyx, and just the first person to comment Bear Camp. The first notification I get on my phone will be the person who gets that elite membership. And then uh, we're also going to do uh, a giveaway on the um, on the Facebook page for our, another elite membership. So be looking for that as well. So big thank you to Onyx for uh, for these two giveaways we're able to bring to y'all. Man, this is an awesome, awesome interview with uh, with Dylan, and uh, y'all get some freebies out of it as well. So make sure to do that. And like you said, first person to get that wins a premium membership for a year yep alrighty guys enjoy this show alrighty and here we go today we're joined by Dylan Dosen of Onyx Maps he's their community coordinator and we're going to talk a little bit of hunting fishing and just how to use their maps to help you be a better hunter on public land with their mapping system how you doing today Dylan Doing well. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Oh, thank you for coming on. Um, when we were talking here in the pre-roll a little bit, you were talking about going on a bear hunt this weekend up there in the big sky country. Um, so public land, private land, invite on some, you know, what you doing up there with that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're fortunate enough. So Onyx is located in Missoula, Montana, which is western Montana. Um, and most of the spring bear seasons close um, June 1st around here in Montana, but uh, right around Missoula, there's a kind of an extension of the season that goes to June 15th. So we, uh, we have a few people in the office and know a few people making the trip up that still have tags in their pocket. So, um, yeah, after, after work tomorrow, we're going to go set up some wall tents and uh, make a long weekend out of it, hopefully get on some bears. But uh, mostly public land, I would say actually all public land, definitely over here. Um, western part of the state, we're, we're fortunate enough to have, you know, a ton of um, forest service land uh, mixed in with a little bit of state BLM and, of course, some private, but for the most part, it's, it's pretty well uh, public. So we can pretty much go and play and, and hunt and look for bears wherever, we're, wherever we end up. That's a, a real 
benefit to living up that way. I was looking at properties in Wyoming and Montana not too long ago thinking if I could just go up there and get a job, it'd be the perfect place to live, <laughs> except for the winters. I, I'm down here in Texas, and you know, you were saying – earlier that it's starting to get up to 75 or so and it's starting to get a little warm for you and it's already 95 plus down here and i imagine you're better suited for the cold than i am because i get cold when it's 45 degrees outside (laughs) yeah i uh i grew up in eastern montana and i think i remember some weeks where it was like negative 45 um so yeah definitely a little bit different climate change for sure but um yeah i mean we we get you know we get some heat too in the summer um but you know, if we hit more than 100 degrees for a few days in a row, that's that's kind of rare. So um, pretty mild, but yeah, it, it should make a good weekend of uh, camping. Anyways, hopefully it doesn't get too warm. Well, hopefully it's not just camping. Hopefully you're bringing home some oh, yeah. good bear meat and a new rug or blanket or whatever you're going to do with that hide off that black bear. Oh yeah, we we should be able to. We've been seeing quite a few around. Um, been out scouting the last few days haven't seen any then but we went out last weekend and saw on um, one day ended up seeing quite a few bears and one guy we were with um punched a tag and yeah it's uh it's been a pretty good spring so far that sounds like some quality hunts how big are the bears up there just out of curiosity that you're trying to get after um they they range obviously you know montana's not really known for it Big, big bears, I have seen some really, you know, good size, like, you know, six and a half foot. And I've even heard of a couple seven foot bears being shot, um, which is, in my opinion, a, a giant bear. Um, but you see a lot of, you know, five and a half foot-ish bears, five, five and a half foot. Um, and that's how a lot of people judge them up here. And I'm kind of new to bear hunting personally. I Like I said, I grew up in in the east side of montana and there's no bears over there so um i've worked here at onyx for it'll be three years now in august so um i'm pretty new to bear hunting but i know everybody and i've kind of learned to judge them based on like the the length of them instead of weight i know that kind of differentiates based on where people are but um yeah like i said i wouldn't say it's known for big bears but you know if you get out and you're patient you can definitely see quite a few of them that's awesome well, can we basically start with uh, kind of a basic af- explanation of, you know, what Onyx is and how the company got started? Yeah, absolutely. So Onyx um, was started in 2009 by Eric Siegfried, um, Onyx's founder. And basically, Eric was, he also grew up in eastern Montana. And it, it, there's a lot of like checkerboard, private, public land over there. Um, so it's it's crucial to know whose land you're on and if you have permission obviously and make sure you don't wander onto the wrong people's land um and a lot of the situations over there specifically too and i think this is you know nationwide it you know it some land's not even fenced where it state butts up to private um and eric wanted to be able to tell exactly where he was at on the map so basically he started creating maps for his own personal use and he was also guiding a little bit um and basically you know created these maps to where he could plug in a chip into his gps unit and see exactly where he was at private or public um and obviously realized that was a great idea and really sought after a piece of equipment that you know not only himself but every hunter throughout the nation could utilize so um he went into business in 2009 um so it did start with that gps chip it was a a physical sd chip that you plug into like a garmin handheld unit um 2011 i think it was is when the onyx app started so basically you know we realized everybody's walking around with a smartphone these days or for the most part everybody is and what's nice about the smartphones and what a lot of people don't realize is they have gps capabilities already built into those um you know it, it runs off satellites so your gps location works with or without cell service um so basically on x then created an app to show all that same great data um but on the phone platform and i guess um you know for those people that aren't familiar with on x you know you could talk we could talk about the uh the ins and outs of every little feature for days on end but essentially 
you know, the, the problem it solves for most people is it shows you the public land, first and foremost, um, the private land, who owns that private land. So, you know, you can see the parcel names and it'll pop up and say John Smith on a particular parcel if that's the owner. Um, on the public land, it'll show you what kind of public land it is. Um, you can look at aerial maps, topographic, and then we do have a ton of other layers that, you know, I'm sure we'll dive into a little bit more in detail later on um, that you can turn on and off and see on the map depending. But essentially, it turns your smartphone into a handheld GPS unit with all that data. Yeah, and that's a great fit, uh, feature. And y'all still offer a physical chip, too, for the, you know, actual handheld GPS devices, don't you? Yep, yep, we absolutely do. Um, you know, more, more and more people are using the app. And, you know, myself included, even a couple of years ago, I, to be honest with you, I relied on my chip and my Garmin um, pretty heavily. You know, I used the app a little bit here or there. But last year, we, we rebuilt the app from the ground up. Um, and basically, the features of the app now and the GPS functionality and the ability to save the maps for use without sale coverage, um, with all those improvements, I haven't turned on a GPS and I think almost two years now. So um, we do sell the chip for those individuals that want to go that route. Um, but yeah, with the new features of the app, um, you know, like I said, for me, I, I haven't touched a GPS in a couple of years. Yeah, I was kind of setting you up with that one. Actually, I have a, a chip sitting in my cart on your store right now uh, for my handheld unit. But what's nice about that is you get a year's worth of the, the app, you know, the online service with the purchase of the chip. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, when you do, that's a great point. When you do buy a chip um, for a Garmin handheld unit, it does come with a redemption code for the membership. Um, and vice versa, if you have a paid membership on your phone and computer, um, if you have a chip, you can update that chip annually for free. Um, and that's another benefit of, of the app version. You know, you can view it right on your phone and your computer for the same membership. Um but say something changed in Texas tomorrow and we were able to get that data, you know, we can update the app instantly almost. Um, whereas the chip, you know, we rely on the communication from us to our customers, letting them know that we updated the chip. And then we also rely on them going in and successfully updating it on the computer. So, you know, with the app, um, you know, you've got the most up-to-date maps at all times. Oh, that's a great feature, the fact that you can basically update it on the fly. Yep. Now, Dylan, I've I've had Onyx for about about a year now. Uh, and when I first downloaded it, I chose to go the app route. And when I did that, you know, I was wanting to get familiarized with the app itself and just kind of everything. I wanted to do it right. I didn't want to just fumble my way around it. So I did find all the instructional videos on the website. And, man, I was really surprised at just how helpful and informational they really were. And, uh, you know, they showed me exactly, you know, how to use everything. And I thought that that was just a great feature that y'all are offering. And their quality videos, you know, it's not 1980s, you know, stuff you used to watch in, in, uh, in high school type videos. It's, uh, it's good stuff, and it really taught me a lot and sped up the process of actually getting to learn and use the app correctly. Yeah, yeah, we, we definitely do, and we're always trying to improve on those and improve on the ways that we can educate, you know, users with the product, and we definitely realize um, it is a, you know, techn piece of technology, um, and a lot of the times in the hunting world, there's some individuals that, you know, are a little bit reluctant to kind of grasp onto that technology and rely on it um, for hunting situations. And, uh, you know, so we're, we're always trying to break that threshold and educate customers. And, you know, we're, we're confident that, you know, if we can educate customers and show them how it can be utilized, even in the backcountry without cell service, um, et cetera, you know, it, it is a reliable piece of technology. Um, so, yeah, that's something we're always trying to work on. And we are currently working on um, like an ebook, if you will, of like a, beginning to end guide of how to use Onyx that will constantly be updated, um, you know, as we update and add stuff to the product. Yeah, that's cool, man. I think that'll be really useful to, like you said, some of the people that are more reluctant to, to start using a technology. Uh, I know 
certain hunters they they want to stick to that chip and don't want to make the the jump over to the app because uh, there's that just that that level of, of fear there of wanting to rely on the smartphone for everything and I, you know I think with with more resources it could kind of urge more people one way or the other or just to jump into it all together yeah absolutely and you know I I still do own a Garmin GPS and once in a while I I did sell my big heavy one and got just like the most compact little one um, since I don't really use it or rely on it but you know I will throw that in my pack from time to time as backup and you know it's definitely beneficial to have backups and to be able to read paper maps and you know in no way are we you know saying that the app is the end all be all you know it's always beneficial to to know other means especially in the safety aspect of it but as far as reliability um you know i've used it on every one of my hunts and really rely on it and scout with it and prep with it and use it in the field and you know it's it's definitely not just me working for onyx but you know i i trust it 100 percent. it's it's been great um but yeah like you said you know there there definitely are some individuals that like the chip and and that's great you know it's a, a product that still lets them know where they're at um and yeah, it's it's still definitely beneficial. Now you said that that that, that the app development started in 2011. Now, what kind of are the pros and cons of the app versus the chip? If you can come up with any. Um, you know, I can come up with with a lot of pros. Um, to start with a con, I guess the only con that I can think of off the top of my head um, is the cell phone battery life. Um, you know, obviously if you have a Garmin GPS, you can throw in a couple extra double A's or throw in, you know, six extra double A's and in the last year a week, um, the phone's G or the phone's battery capabilities, I should say, sometimes are weak, um, in my opinion. And what I've found is, especially doing any overnight trips, um, up here in Montana, when it gets cold at night, even in the summer, you know, it might dip down below forties at night and you know, high thirties sometimes. And, uh, it really takes a toll on the battery life. So sometimes I'll go to bed with my phone at 80% and wake up with it at 30. Um, so that's one thing that is, it, I would say a disadvantage, but with that being said, I mean, there's a lot of great portable chargers. I carry around like one more like rugged portable charger and one really lightweight, like, you know, single charge charger that I usually keep in like a safety kit. Um, and then a lot of people are also buying, you know, the solar panels from like gold zero and whatnot to charge your phone. So, I mean, beyond that, um, some of the quick pros that I can think of, uh, on the app, you know, we touched on that it's updated continuously. So you don't have to worry about that. You can toggle between a topographic map, um, an aerial imagery map and like a hybrid of both. So, you know, typically the GPS and the chip, you're just looking at topo, which is great, but it's really beneficial just to be looking at an area on topo and then at a tap of a button on the app, you know, you're looking at that exact area with imagery so you can see like where open parks are, where streams are, where, you know, a lake is, um, et cetera. So that's, that's one of the obvious ones. Um, beyond that, um, another big one I can think of just real quick is the customization of it. So with the chip and the GPS, um, you know, what you see is what you get. The data is just there. Um, with the app, I can go in, you know, as I'm speaking here, I'm looking at my app, and I can go in and turn off layers if I don't want to see it. Say I don't want to see a private parcel boundary. All I have to do is just uncheck that layer, and then it removes it from the map. Um, or say I want to see, like, a, a fire burn history, um, historic wildfire layer. I can turn that on and all of a sudden all that data is right overlaying on top of my map and it'll show, for example, you know, parameters of a, a wildlife fire, um, the year it burnt, the eight bridge, you know, all sorts of information and data. Um, with that being said, you know, you can tap on that and more information will pop up um, about whatever you're tapping on. So, uh, for example, in Montana, we have different big game uh hunting units for different species. So with the chip, you're kind of, um, you know, you're at mercy of what 
what we have on the chip, which is like the most standard, which is the deer, elk, and lion unit. Um, but with the app, I can go in and it's springtime here in Montana, obviously, so I have the black bear units on. Um, so you just, you know, toggle between the species and then those units come up. I can tap on a specific unit and then a URL will pop up. Um, if I tap on that URL, it'll tell me like a quota status for that unit. It'll tell me, you know, the season dates, all sorts of different information about it. So the app is definitely a lot more informational um, and dynamic than I would say the chip. But like I said, you know, each each product has its own use and they're they're definitely complementary of each other. Um, a quick question for you, Dylan, about all the different layers yeah. and pop- property boundaries and stuff that you can all factor into the maps. Is all that downloadable so you can try and conserve your cell phone battery and keep your cell phone on airplane mode? Because I know especially when I'm out in the deep woods of East Texas where there's not a cell phone tower around and all my phone does is search for service, it will suck my phone down, you know, where normally, you know, I have an iPhone 7 Plus and it generally, you know, will last, you know, two days without a charge. But when I'm out there, it's only good for, you know, eight to ten hours because it's just constantly searching for service unless it's on airplane mode. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the most, that's, I would say by far the biggest misconception with the app is, well, it won't work if I don't have service. Um, We do have the ability to save the maps for offline use. And what you're doing there is you're saving a portion of the map that you're headed to um, for offline. So if you don't have cell service there, or even if you do have cell service there, to your point, um, a lot of the times here, you kind of have decent cell coverage, but, um, you know, trying to use the internet and trying to use, you know, that service that constantly drains my battery. So even if I have cell service, I'll save that area. That way, when I get out there, I'll just flip my phone into airplane mode, like you mentioned, um, or offline mode, which is, you know, integrated into our app. And uh, at that point, you still get all the maps that you had before, um, all the layers you can turn on and off as long as you saved it with those layers turned on. Um, And it will still track your GPS location. So you can still mark waypoints, you know, track yourself, um, trails, all sorts of different stuff. Yeah, that's a common misconception about cell phones. You actually cannot turn off the GPS, you know, in the cell phone. It stays on, you know, even if you have your GPS turned off, it's still on. Yeah, yeah. So the GPS will definitely work offline um, with or without coverage. The only... The only part that you need to save is the, the actual map itself so you can see you know, the map that your GPS location is shown on. And how big are those files for a, a typical hunting area, would you say? Um, you know, it, it really depends because, like, for example, this weekend, bear hunting, from where we're camping, we could go, shoot, you know, 15, 20 miles in all directions. So it really depends on what your – you're looking at doing as far as how big of an area, but we have the option to save like a five mile wide area, a 10 mile wide area and 150 mile wide area. Um, so roughly, let's see, I'm looking at that area here, that five mile wide, which is super detailed resolution, by the way, you can zoom in very tight and get like the great, you know, crisp imagery. Um, whereas the 150 mile wide, you obviously get much more you know, uh, data and land save, but you can't zoom in real tight and get that clean imagery, et cetera. So, uh, you know, it works for borders and stuff, but if you're looking for individual trails or ponds or anything like that, uh, you'll definitely want to save the five or 10 mile. Um, but yeah, looking at, let's see, a 10 mile wide resolution, uh, it says estimated download size between a hundred and 300 megabytes. Um, you know, which is about, which is the same for all three of those. Yeah. So even at the 150 mile wide, it's between 100 and 300 megabytes. So not a whole lot. Yeah, that's not bad at all. That's, you know, probably about the equivalent on a newer cell phone taking a picture at the highest resolution. Yeah, yeah. So it's not bad at all. I mean, I have the entire um, state of Montana saved in the high resolution, or the 150 mile wide low resolution um, save maps. And then, I've got probably 20-ish, like 10 mile wide, which is like the pretty crisp imagery resolution saved. So you can, you know, as long as your phone has the memory for it, you can definitely save the entire state if you want to. Okay, that's great. Um, One other question for you. 
uh, the the aerial imagery is that how often is that update updated is it you know obviously it's probably not updated annually and but i know it always helps to find blowdowns burns and things of those natures to see you know the more updated mm-hmm. aerial imagery you have the better it is yeah absolutely um so the it's kind of a, a tricky answer to that question because the aerial imagery in some parts of the country is updated almost annually. Some other parts of the country might be two years, might be three years, might be four years old. Um, and we've even seen some parts of the country older. So we are currently right now working on a solution to providing more accurate and up-to-date aerial imagery across the board. Um, like I said, some some areas and some states and some counties is great updated, you know, very often. Uh, but we want to make sure it's consistent and updated all across the country. So we are working right now on providing that and basically doing a lot of work internally with our, our GIS team and our engineers to make make that happen. Um, so right now it's tough to answer that question, but here, here in the, the near future we should should be able to let people know, um, you know, more in more detail when it was updated. Well, perfect. At least there, at least it's not ten year old that. At least you're trying and you're trying to get it to where it's updated annually, which would be spectacular. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, the more updated that we can get, the better for sure. So we're always going to be, you know, and even when we make this improvement, we're going to be looking for the next improvement, the next way that we can, you know, get it even more up to date and better for everybody. Excellent. Um, what are the most commonly used layers? Would you say you know what are the ones you use the 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 most common? I would say the most common for sure are just the private and public lands. Um, you know, those are kind of the main reason I would say people get the product is to be able to see exactly what land they're on. Um, beyond that, I mean, for me personally, I'm always using the hunting districts here in Montana. We have a lot of special application tags um, and some tags that if you draw, you can't hunt any other unit, et cetera. There's a lot of places you can go hunt like general season elk where, you know, the unit next to it, maybe you have to apply for. So I'm always using the uh, hunting districts layer as well. Um, Shoot. We've got uh, Montana. So block management Montana is a, a great program um ran by fish wildlife and parks it's essentially private land that lets people come on to hunt um and it's a program through fwp and it's it's excellent i mean it opens up an extremely large amount of acreage um to go hunt on so i'm using that one a lot i know there's similar programs in several different states so we try and get all that data as well um see looking at you know the state State data, that's for the most part what I specifically use. But if you go to our nationwide layers, we have a ton of very specific niche data. That's great. Um, we have a roadless areas layer um, that Randy Newberg, one of our ambassadors, kind of came up with and we, we created. And what that does is in a heat map, it shows areas farthest away from all roads. So if you're you know, getting out for a weekend and you just want to get away from people on a hike, or if you're looking for late country elk, um, you know, the bulls that have split off and kind of more in secluded areas, you can turn that layer on and see areas far as the way away from the roads. So that's a great one. Um, we've got a layer in conjunction with Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. We have one with uh, National Wild Turkey Federation. Um, an Eastman's MRS data layer where it shows all their MRS data for draw odds and stats. Um, I mentioned the historic wildfire. That's a, a big one up here in Montana. We usually get several fires throughout the, the summer. Um, so not only is it good to find like areas that have good regrowth for hunting the next you know few years, but it's also beneficial safety-wise. Like last year, I was planning on doing an elk hunt, and I turned on the fire layer, and just overnight, a fire, you know, completely went into that area um so it was all on fire so instead of driving down there three hours and looking up at the mountain and realizing that wasn't a safe good idea um i was able to see it right on the the phone um so that one was pretty cool um 
beyond that, like I said, we've just got we have several Boone and Crockett trophy big game records. We've got a prairie dog layer, um, uh, huge extents of trails. I would say one of the most used ones besides like the private public lands would definitely be the trails. Um, we show you all the the public trails as well as like the mileage in between the trail intersections, and then we also have a trail slope layer. So that will show you the different gradient levels, like the green um, overlay will be kind of a gradual or flat. Yellow will be a little bit steeper and red is a more steep part of the trail. So I uh, use that one quite a bit as well. But yeah, it's it's really great because people, everybody uses it differently for their application. And, uh, you know, how I use it versus my hunting partner could be completely different. But uh, all that data is there so you can see it or choose to hide it you know as you please yeah i like some of those layers i didn't know y'all had the uh the trail gradients on the trail maps that's actually really good especially for me here where i'm actually seeking out hills to run because i live in such a flat part of the state yeah yeah absolutely that's a relative new layer um we've added quite a few this year and you know as the data becomes available and as ideas come up around the office we'll definitely continue to add and improve those and i believe that there's a isn't there a distance on that trails layer as well uh, in miles so you can see how long that public trail is and then also layer on the the elevation or the the incline rather yeah for sure so the uh the mileage is in between intersections of a trail so it's not like the entire trail but um the portion of that trail between intersections so you know, if I'm at a Y in a trail, I can look at it and be like, okay, it's 0. 0.6 miles to the next intersection if I take a right. Or it's, you know, eight miles to the next intersection if I take a left in this spot. Um, we don't quite have the gradient, um, you know, elevation gain or, or loss, but that is something that we are working on. Awesome. Awesome. Now, speaking of, like, kind of newer stuff, um isn't waypoint sharing uh, something you've come up with here recently and uh, the ability the ability to share those waypoints with other people that use onyx maps yeah absolutely so that is a, a new one as well um so now i can drop a waypoint on the map and that's something we're using right now with this bear hunt coming up um you know we have quite a few different people coming up to uh to do this bear hunt and it's a big collaboration and so, you know, we found a camp spot and we're able to mark that on a waypoint. And then we can just tap on that waypoint, hit share, and then you can choose to either text it, email it, copy the link, you know, put it in social media if you wanted to. But essentially we're, we're tapping that waypoint, hitting share, texting our, our buddies and the people coming up um, the waypoint. And then on the receiving end, they would receive a text message tap on the um, link on the X logo and basically it would pull up their app and save that waypoint in that, that exact same spot in their app. So, um, you know, you, if you share a waypoint with somebody who doesn't already have the app, it basically prompts them to download. And as soon as they download and set up a free trial, um, then that waypoint goes right up in their app. So yeah, that's a, a great addition. I've used it a ton. Um, I was fortunate enough to harvest a cow elk on a late season hunt and needed help packing it out a couple miles back to the pickup in the snow and whatnot. And um, I had a buddy nearby, actually a coworker that I just texted a waypoint right to where I was with, with my uh, downed elk and they were able to grab a pack and come up and help. And it was in the middle of the night. There's no way possible that, you know, he would have found me without that. Yeah. yeah. That seems that's like, a, that's awesome. Yeah, that seems like a see who your true friends are kind of feature because I can see that being real useful whenever the work starts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've like I said, I've used it once and and everything worked out. Um, otherwise, basically, I probably would have, you know, had to take care of it and come back in the morning and miss a morning of work. So it was on a Sunday night, and um, yeah, it was super beneficial there and just little meetup spots or like. You know, hey, I'm looking at this ridge for next weekend. What do you think about it? Have you been there, et cetera? Like, shoot it over to a hunting buddy. Um, and that's kind of the, the start of that sharing feature. So, um, obvi you know, obviously we're always improving on stuff, always 
expanding and in the future you know we want to be able to share you know our our routes our um, tracks that we made out hiking um, and all sorts of different stuff so yeah that's kind of the the starting point to it and we'll see where it goes from there now one thing i really like about the waypoint just in general is the ability to go in and actually label each one of those if somebody even sends me one i can label it how i want to label it because i'm big on organizing my waypoints i like everything named a certain thing because it means something else to me than it might to somebody else uh so that's a big thing for me that i really like doing yeah absolutely and i actually just recently last night went through all my waypoints and a lot of times when i'm on the fly you know in a hunting situation i'll drop a waypoint real quick and not change the icon to something specific or not name it um so yeah i noticed last last night my maps were uh overran with waypoints that I wasn't exactly sure what it was but um yeah it's great to be able to at least change the icon so you know I've got almost every place I see a bear I drop a a waypoint and put a bear icon with it so you know next year spring season I can pull up my map real quick and and quickly reference where every bear I saw the last couple years were or you know however you want to use it campsites whatever but you can definitely put in notes and go in in greater detail, you know, of, of what you're seeing or what you're marking. Yeah. That's what I like to do. So, um, one of the other things that I, I like about the apps is that you, it syncs between different devices. Like you can get on your computer and, or your phone, um, your iPad, whatever, and put your, your waypoints, your trails, your camps, your stands, whatever you want into the app. Um, and they all sync across the app, I know. Um, how many different devices, you know, are you allowed to connect with your subscription to the to the service? Yeah, that is a, a good point. It's something that's really beneficial. So, you know, to piggyback off that, they do all sync between devices that you're logged in on. And, you know, we also – We talked about one of the most utilized layers, one of the most underutilized, in my opinion, features of our product is when you buy the app, when you get the membership, it also allows you to pull up that same data, same map, um, same features on the computer desktop version. So, you know, what you can do and what I do a lot of times scouting and preparation and planning my hunts is I'll go onto the computer on a bigger screen or even, you know, hook my computer up to a TV and see it on a great big screen um, and mark waypoints and kind of stuff I want to go check out and then it automatically syncs to my phone so when I'm out in the field you know um, everything I scouted and checked out and planned everything synced directly to my phone and vice versa so I can go out on my phone create a bunch of waypoints of you know if it's in September and I'm elk hunting I can create a bunch of waypoints of elk rubs and wallows and different sign and then come back and look at it on the computer on a much bigger screen and really kind of, you know, put all the pieces together of, you know, looking at topographic and all my waypoints and trying to figure out, okay, where are they bedding, where are they feeding, you know, what routes might they be using? So that's really beneficial. Um, but as far as number of devices, you know, it's, it's really, as long as you're locked in on with your specific email and password, it doesn't really matter. So, for example, if I have two phones, I can log into my account on both those phones. Oh, well, that's great because, you know, I have my my laptop set up here in the podcast studio, but a lot of times, you know, at night when I'm doing scouting, either I'll do it on my phone, but I like to use the iPad because, you know, like you said, it's a bigger screen and you can scroll Mm -hmm. around and find you know, the little places that I'm thinking, well, I'd like to go check out this spot, this spot, this spot. And so it's nice to know that you're not limited so long as you're just logged in with your membership. You can connect to as many devices as you want. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of people do use like a tablet and a phone. Uh, no problem at all. And then I also really like going, uh, you know, like you said, either putting it up on the, using the HDMI port on the on the laptop to hook it up to the to the big screen or you know i know come duck season i'm just pouring over maps constantly trying to find new spots better spots spots that look good to try and dig into 
you know, where my next hunting spot's going to be. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And that's, like I said, you know, even with this weekend, this bear hunt, you know, I've been just pouring over the maps and, uh, and really looking at different spots and marking waypoints. And then, you know, after work driving up and checking the waypoints and, um, it's just a seamless transition between the phone and the computer, um, that, like I said, in my opinion, I feel like people underutilize or forget about a little bit. Yeah, I can definitely see that being the great feature. Um, so as far as, um, water, I've never actually used the Onyx maps for, for, for like duck hunting and stuff. Does it also show the navigable waterways and like down here, duck hunting the coast, the bays and stuff, you know, in the event that a bay would be public or private? Yeah, it does. And that's something that I'm not, you know, specifically familiar with a lot just because up here in Montana, uh, we're fortunate enough that if it's a waterway, it, it's public, um, you know, and you can basically wade into a stream and walk up and down that stream for a hundred miles and it's public land. Um, and I know some states aren't, aren't like that. And it's, you know, some people can technically own that, or I think, you know, I, I'm not going to misspeak and, and say which state, but I'm pretty sure there's a couple other states that, you know, if you're on a boat, for example, that's great, but you can't drop an anchor or you can't, you know, step out of your boat onto the land beneath the water. Um, but yeah, with that being said, I mean, it shows all the public and private data. So if anything was privately owned, it would reflect that on the map. Yeah, that's a really great feature, especially for those certain states. Um, I know which a couple of the states you're talking about because uh, <laughs> guys have to put their put their boats in in the backwash of a big boulder just to manage to go try and catch a trout because they can't you yeah. know even touch the rock if they touch the rock that's in the middle of it you know the game warden will come write them a ticket which i think is absolutely ridiculous yeah like i said we're we're fortunate enough in montana that we we don't have to, to really deal with that one um you know it's if it's a waterway um it's, it's public for the most part and uh yeah it's it's fortunate and i guess something that you know i've kind of taken for granted for sure yeah, and it's pretty much the same way here in Texas. Any navigable waterway is, you know, public land, but or public water. But it's there are places, especially when you get down to the coastal marshes or st and areas like that, where it gets a little bit. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, because it goes by the uh, the high water line. Gotcha, gotcha. And uh, yeah, the would, application uh, for Onyx, yeah, right, yeah. Is, is to clarify that. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, that's, you know, like we chatted about in the beginning of our conversation is the main reason the product was, was introduced and, um, you know, why, why it took off for sure. Well, Dylan, is there anything else you really want to, uh, you know, tell us about, you know, the Onyx app, you know, the whole gamut of features that's in there that we haven't touched on yet, you know, something that, that we perhaps missed that we didn't get to. You know, I, I think we went over most of it. Um, you know, like I said, we could talk about features until, you know, we're blue in the face. There's there's a lot of different features and stuff. Um, one of the ones that, you know, I don't think we chatted about, we, we went over the fact of, you know, creating waypoints, obvious GPS functionality. Um, you can track yourself, too. So if I'm not on a hike, you know, I can just turn on my tracker, um, throw my phone into airplane mode and go on a hike and – you know, I've used that one quite a bit personally for finding good routes in and out of places. Um, you know, Western Montana, we're pretty pretty rough country sometimes, uh, definitely mountainous area. So just because you see a herd of elk doesn't mean, you know, you're going to have a, a good navigable way over to it. So a lot of times I use that tracking feature to basically um, – see where I went and basically note in there if it was a good route or not a good route you know you might get clipped out or something and put a note on that track of you know do not go this route go 200 yards west or something like that so that's a feature I use quite a bit um but yeah I mean I think for the most part we went over most of the features and most of the layers and you know we're 
we're always updating and, and constantly evolving and improving. So just because the app looks looks this way today doesn't mean it's going to tomorrow. We've we've got some big things coming up and whatnot. So um, pretty pretty excited even for the last three years that I've worked at Onyx to see the evolution and the improvements made. You know is is pretty huge. So I'm definitely excited to see that uh, continuing. Okay, well I know there's one last big thing we didn't touch on. How much does it cost? Yeah, so the app is to to download to get a free seven day trial. It's absolutely free. Um, that's to give people seven days with it, full functionality, just to make sure it's going to work for them. You know, go you know go check out your hunting spots, go use it on a hunt or a hike or whatever. Um, so that's free seven days. You know, you, we don't charge you after or anything like that. All you have to do is go to the App Store. Um, or Google Play Store if you're on an Android, and basically download it, set up a free trial. All we need is an email email address and your name, and you're good to go for seven days. Um, after those seven days, you know you can still use the app for like GPS functionality, but it won't show private land, public land, a lot of the features and you know data we discussed. It won't show that stuff. Um, so at which point, uh, for a single state for a year membership is twenty nine ninety nine. And for all 50 states for a year membership, so nationwide coverage, um, you get that for $99.99. So 100 bucks for all 50 states, um, and you're, you're good to go on all your different devices and whatnot. And then the chip um, is $119.99, and that comes with, as you mentioned, a, a redeem code for a free, free year of a premium single-state membership. Excellent. So it's actually cheaper than buying a gps it's cheaper than buying other companies map cards and you've already got the thing that you need to make it work everyone has a cell phone i don't know anyone who doesn't have a smartphone anymore unless they're just not anymore i think i think (laughs) i think even our grandmother who's in her 80s has a smartphone now and can actually use the thing which is kind of (laughs) scary yeah i know uh i know my nephew that's three years old can about use one as good as I can now. So it's, it's definitely uh, more and more prominent and a lot of people are using them and more and more people are relying on them in the back country or just for everyday hunts. Yeah. And the fact that your maps are constantly updated, that's one of the greatest things in the world. You know, halfway through season, something changes, something becomes available or closed, you know, the Apple update and, you know, now, you know, in your app, Yep, for sure, for sure. And, you know, I I know for myself personally, it's, it's a little bit scary to think of all the money I spend every year on hunting equipment um, and a $30 app to be able to hunt my state properly and know exactly where I'm at and where I can legally, you know, use those thousands of dollars of hunting equipment and bows and rifles and gas and everything every year, you know, 30 bucks to be able to to know where you're at and legally use all that stuff and not wind up in trouble. Um, you know, it's a small price to pay for sure. In my opinion. Definitely. I'm right there with you. Well, as we're going to go ahead and wrap up here, uh, you've got an awesome hunting story, something that that's just spectacular that's happened up there in Montana to you, or maybe something that's absolutely hilarious that's happened, you know, out in the field. Mm -hmm. Let me see it. Throw me on the spot here. Um, I have a lot of good hunting stories. I'm trying to think of a, a recent one. Um, last year, I was fortunate enough, I guess I'll relate this one a little bit, to working at Onyx. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to work for Onyx, and I, I really, you know, I like the company. I, I appreciate the values and, and definitely align with mine. And um, I was fortunate enough last year to be able to go on an elk hunt with Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation um, with Onyx, you know, kind of as that partnership. So I was a hunter on that. It was a Montana hunt and uh, wasn't my first, you know, archery at full or anything like that. And, and definitely wasn't my biggest, but it was, it was a really cool hunt. It was fun to basically, I met up with people I had never met before. Um, I met up with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation um, CEO at the time, um, David Allen and a couple other guys from RMEF and I had never been on a film hunt, whatever. So 
for me, that was a, a really cool situation, um, you know, to go meet a bunch of guys I've never met before ever and, and have a week long hunt, um, you know, made some great friends and, and was fortunate enough to harvest a, a bull with my bow. So one of the more recent ones would be that one, you know, nothing crazy about the hunt or the story, but it was just a, a pretty cool opportunity for me personally, you know, with working for Onyx. Well, yeah, that definitely sounds like a great experience getting to, you know, getting to go on a filmed hunt to go, you know, with Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation to go actually harvest a bull with your bow. You know, that sounds yep. like an absolute awesome thing to go do, especially with a bunch of guys yeah. that you've never met before and, you know, get to get that kind of camaraderie with a whole new group of guys and, you know, build lifelong friendships. It seems like all my friends that last the longest and always stick around and I know will always be there are all my buddies that hunt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. And yeah, it was, it was just something different out of my element. I grew up, you know, I grew up hunting and, and fishing mostly with family and friends and it was something that I had never done before. And it, it was an awesome trip. One I'll never forget. And, you know, they were, like I said, able to film the whole thing and put something together. So yeah, that was uh, probably one of my more recent ones. Well, shoot, Dylan, I guess I'm going to let you go ahead and get off the line here. I know it's 5 o'clock there in Montana, and you're probably ready to go probably do a little scouting maybe for yep. some bears this weekend. So we'll let you get off the line here. Um, and if you want to send me a waypoint to where bear camp is, and I'll see if I can maybe get up there before Saturday. Perfect. Yeah. No, uh, you guys will have to let me know if you ever end up coming up here to Montana, and we'll have to uh, to get out in the springtime. Um, but yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. The second I get off phone, I'm going to hop in the pickup, go check out some new stuff and, uh, hopefully lock down a few bears for this weekend. Well, definitely. Um, send me a picture. If you get a bear, I'd like to see it and, uh, get out there, be safe and have a good time and make sure, you know, next year, you know, go ahead and just send me a waypoint and I'll, I'll find a way to get up there. <laughs> Alrighty. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll let you know how it, how it goes this weekend for sure. Excellent. I appreciate it, Dylan. You have a great one, man. Thanks, Dylan. Yep, thank you guys for having me on. Anytime.